All right, here we go with part three of chapter 18, the final installment for this semester. Uh, continuing with evolutionary medicine, and specifically, uh, this covers sections 18.9 through 18.12. So let's head in and see what this is about. So let's begin by addressing the point that we get older than people used to. And getting older means we deal with uh, ailments and sicknesses that people didn't used to have to deal with. So, of course, humans have always aged, <laughs> and presumably we always will. And with aging comes different consequences. Brittle bones, for example, uh, loss of stamina, you take a look at the figure in the lower right showing how as we age uh, the number of meters per second that we can run decreases uh, and immune defenses weaken as well it becomes more difficult to fight off uh, infections uh, certain diseases become more likely at the same time such as cancer as more cells in our bodies are dividing and hence more opportunity for mutations that could give rise to cancer. Uh, also heart disease, more likely as we get older. Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia kind of diseases. So getting older, although we like to do it because most people want to keep on living, uh, can carry these significant consequences. Um, now, of course, mutations that cause death at an early age are selected against and eliminated pretty quickly. Because if you can't reproduce to pass on those mutations that cause an early death, then those mutations aren't going to be passed on and they will be eliminated. Uh, mutations that cause death after reproduction, though, of course, are shielded from natural selection. And uh, those kinds of mutations, in fact, may uh, promote fitness earlier in life. Uh, they may be mutations that increase an organism's chance to survive and reproduce. Uh, but those same mutations may end up causing ailments later in life, leading to death. And this is yet another example of antagonistic pleiotropy. In fact, of the 76 genes known to have a, a role, have a place in cardiovascular disease, uh, 40 of them that have been carefully inspected have been found to be associated with early life reproductive traits. So there you go. Many of the genes associated with deteriorating hearts, uh, those same genes may favor uh, better, more successful uh, survival and reproduction earlier in life, antagonistic pleiotropy. Uh, mutations to the BRCA1 gene, and I should have italicized that, I see that now, there's always editing that needs to take place, can drastically increase uh, risk to breast and ovarian cancer, but women that carry these mutations also tend to have more children over their lifetimes compared to women with a harmless BRCA1 gene. So again, antagonistic pleiotropy. Seems to be a reason why certain ailments, diseases that we're now experiencing much later in life uh, occur and explains why we didn't see these earlier in uh, our recent human history because people simply were not living long enough for these genes to start showing this uh, these antagonistic pleiotropic effects. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the natural selection of cancer here, with cancer of course being one of those diseases that uh, has become more common arising in older age. We're multicellular creatures, and animals evolved perhaps about 750 million years ago, going from our unicellular protists to multicellular animals. 
And of course, with multicellularity comes lots of cell divisions, uh, lots of cooperation amongst cells for, quote, doing the right thing, cooperating in this multicellular environment. And so the opportunity for cheater cells to thrive came about. Remember our uh, cheater cells when we dealt with the uh, plasmodial slime mold uh, in an earlier chapter. And cheater cells in a multicellular creature like us animals are known as cancer because indeed mutations can arise uh, at any cell division. There's always that opportunity when DNA is replicating. And of course, chances of mutation increase with exposure to environmental influences as well, like say, for example, uh, smoking uh, or UV radiation for skin cancer. And uh, these mutations affect the cell cycle and those that do affect the cell cycle can cause runaway cell division, which is cancer. And these mutations, as uh, you, you've been exposed to, often involves oncogenes and tumor suppressing genes. So there's multiple genes that uh, need to be uh, knocked out and modified in order for cancer to take off. If an individual inherits a defective copy already from a parent, then they already have a head start towards potentially getting cancer. That means that uh, fewer mutations are required in one's somatic cells over one's lifetime uh, in order to get the uh, appropriate collection of mutations in multiple genes that can get cancer rolling. So being predisposed genetically, of course, uh, increases the risk quite a bit. Now, here's uh, ultimately what this figure is talking about that's taking up much of the right-hand part of your slide. Once cancer begins, natural selection can kick in, and natural selection can act on individual cell lines within a tumor, speeding up their evolution. And that's what the figure to the right is, uh, is showing you, uh, documenting a, a specific case of um, cancer taking off in an individual. And as treatment uh, ensued with chemotherapy, then the multiple different uh, lines of cells that are accumulated, which you can see over uh, here, these different lines of cells, uh, different color coding, then as chemotherapy hit them, uh, you can see that the cell number and the tumor size went down. So chemotherapy drastically reduced the cell population, uh, shrinking the tumor, but a few cells survived. They weren't all knocked out. And those that survived then were resistant to chemotherapy and uh, you get a relapse back into cancer because now you've got cell lines that are resistant to those drugs administered through chemotherapy. And uh, down here we see sort of a phylogeny of these cell lines and how this cancer unfolded over time, different cell lines arising with their different mutations giving rise to resistance. So uh, this poses a challenge of course to being able to defeat cancer because the evolution uh, continues, um, changes in uh, cell lines, even within a tumor, uh, and a posing challenge of not being able to uh, completely eradicate that cancer. So besides the evolution of cancer due to our multicellularity and the risk that that poses to developing mutations during our lifetime that could eventually trigger cancer to begin, that's what the last slide was mainly uh, emphasizing, as well as the fact that uh, cancer can evolve within a, a person being exposed to chemotherapy. But here we're seeing uh, another aspect of how we are mismatched with our modern life. Um, over the past century, 
deaths from infectious diseases have declined precipitously. You can take a look at the figure on the bottom left of the slide. Um, it's remarkable. Deaths per 100,000 per year have gone way, way down. And in those countries that have experienced these kinds of drops in infectious diseases, we also see that autoimmune diseases have dramatically increased simultaneously um, or concomitantly. And so, for example, Crohn's disease, an, uh, you know, disease in which the immune system attacks one's intestinal lining, has gone way up. Asthma uh, involves lung inflammation, gone way up. Type 1 diabetes, this is where one's immune system attacks insulin-producing cells in the pancreas, gone way up. And what we see is these diseases, uh, the disease frequency tracks affluence. So these kinds of diseases tend to be afflicting those who are wealthier. Um, we have higher rates of autoimmune diseases in cities compared to rural areas within the same country. So this all implies that while we evolved and adapted to a particular way of life over millions of years as hominins, that our recent conversion to a completely new way of life, which kind of goes along with our affluence, uh, has indeed left us mismatched to our modern life and hence susceptible to many diseases that uh, before were uh, much more rare. So yes, until recently, most people died before they reached old age. Uh, lifespans um, 200 years ago, you'd be lucky if you lived past the age of 40. And, you know, things like pathogens, bacteria, viruses, starvation would have been likely to kill you. Uh, now that so many people are reaching an old age with life expectancy being close to 80 years, we now see, couldn't see this in the recent past, that antagonistic pleiotropy has revealed itself. And antagonistic pleiotropy is the likely explanation for several of our diseases associated with aging, older age. So as an example, we can look at the epsilon-4 uh, gene and its associated protein. Epsilon-4 is an allele of the APOE gene, and epsilon-4 is associated with the rise of Alzheimer's disease. So 14, about 14.5% 14 of our world's population carries the epsilon-4 allele a significant lumber, number. If you inherit one copy of epsilon-4, you are two to three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. If you inherit two copies of epsilon-4 and you're homozygous, you are 12 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. This makes me want to know if I'm carrying the epsilon-4 allele. <laughs> Neurons with epsilon-4 produce more tangles of protein. And the microglia, which are the immune cells that go around and, you know, clean things up, if these tangles of protein are being made, the microglia cells are ineffective against uh, what's going on. And so Alzheimer's disease then advances. So we see, though, however, that epsilon-4 protects uh, cognitive development in malnourished infants. So there's a selective benefit. There's an advantage to that epsilon-4 allele early in age. It protects us when we're young. And in fact, women who are exposed to disease from, say, contaminated water uh, still have high fertility. Epsilon-4 seems to protect them as well, as we've uh, seen from studies of uh, people in Ghana, West Africa. So um, the Epsilon-4 allele may have increased fitness uh, in our ancestors by improving survival and fertility. And of course, if they died by the time they were 40 years old, then the uh, flip side of having that allele was never exposed. 
developing Alzheimer's. But in countries with improved sanitation and medical care and people living to much older ages, the alleles expression in old age uh, shows its downsides, which is the antagonistic pleiotropy. And of course, another thing that we are dealing with, humanity in the 21st century, is that we are maladapted to our modern diet. Uh, over the past several million years, hominins have been evolving. Uh, Australopithecus, uh, earlier species of Homo, uh, and our own genus, and have been shaped by shifting diets. Uh, we, can, we can see that our guts and teeth, especially the fossil record uh, preserves teeth quite well, have changed in response to our changes in our plant and meat diet. Um, so we have evolved gradually to keep up with those changes. Uh, throughout this history, a hunter-gatherer lifestyle prevailed until about 10,000 years ago when modern agriculture popped up and people began staying settled in one place and growing their own food instead of moving when conditions got harsh and finding new food resources. Then we hit the 20th century and we had a major shift to a high sugar, high fat diet with all of our processed foods that manufacturers were happy to provide for us. We had adapted as primates, as hominins, to have a taste for sugar. It makes sense, right? If we encountered a source of sugar in the wild as hunter-gatherers, it was to our benefit to ingest and eat as much as that as we could because the source of that sugar would be fleeting. You know, some trees, some plants that had fruits growing on them, they're not going to be around for a long time. The fruits would mature, fall off, rot, they're gone. Um, so, but... Uh, that So that taste for sugar was adaptive and increased our survival and our fitness. But now that taste for sugar puts us at a high risk for obesity and diabetes because the sources of sugar don't go away. We can go to the store every day and, and purchase more food with lots of sugar, lots of fat. And so we're now uh, maladapted to our modern diet. The thrifty genotype hypothesis came up in the 1960s and uh, basically said that our bodies are adapted to a feast or famine cycle. And we stored fat when we had um, a feast period, when we had access to a lot of calories, a lot of food. And then as um, you know, that food disappeared, uh, as our, you know, our hunter-gatherers, uh, then we could... Uh, subsist off of that stored fat and make it to the next feast. Um, but what we see is that uh, some human populations are more vulnerable to obesity and diabetes than others. And so naturally we try to come up with hypotheses to explain why there's differential vulnerability amongst populations of humors, humans. So uh, Pacific Islanders, for example, um, show a very high rates of obesity and diabetes in the face of this modern 20th century diet, now 21st century. And uh, um, arguments been made that they were uh, uh, exposed to especially strong selection for feast and famine physiology, uh, given where they lived on their uh, isolated Pacific islands. So they adapted to taking those calories and uh, converting them to fat much more readily and easily than other people around the world. Um, however, there's a caveat, but, and you'll see that there's lots of alternatives remaining on this slide, hunter-gatherers actually experience less famine than subsistence farmers do. So actually, hunter-gatherers uh, seem to have a more persistent source of food. 
than subsistence farmers who are staying in one place and sometimes their crops fail. And then there is dramatic famine. So it pokes a hole in the thrifty genotype hypothesis. I'm not saying it's completely falsified, but there's a problem. And here's another component. We would expect recent natural selection for genes that are associated with diabetes or obesity. So uh, this physiological response uh, to you know, putting on more fat would raise fitness in early humans, and we should see signals of that selection in our genome. And as we've touched on earlier in this course, there are techniques and methods for identifying whether genes have experienced high amounts of natural selection in our past. But there's no evidence of selection. Uh, no evidence of selection has been found with those associated genes. So, pokes a hole in that hypothesis. Doesn't completely eliminate it, but makes it a little bit weaker. Uh, here's an alternative. Maybe people living in cold climates evolved higher metabolic rates uh, to keep them warm, protecting them from a Western diet. Well, that's a possibility. It remains to be supported by uh, independent testing. Uh, here's yet another hypothesis. Um, maybe for the hypothesis to be clear for how we're maladapted to our modern diet, maybe our ancestors experienced negative selection for fat storage because they could more easily evade predators. So, in our more distant past, as our ancestors were uh, not living in such larger, you know, protected societies, staying in one place, defending themselves from predators, but out in the open as hunters and gatherers, it would have been beneficial to not be storing large amounts of fat, negative selection. And with the advent of weapons to be able to hunt prey and protect ourselves, that kind of risk would have declined and heavier people would be more likely to survive and pass on their genes. So then the selective pressure against fat storage would poof, disappear, allowing obesity-related genes to rise in frequency. So what you're seeing by this list of possibilities is that we don't really know, we don't really fully understand uh, what has made us so vulnerable to these diseases associated with obesity and diabetes uh, and, you know, what's happened uh, in comparison to our evolutionary history over the past couple million years. So the bottom line at the bottom of the slide, we don't know the evolutionary reason for our vulnerabilities to obesity. It's still work in progress. But it remains to be said that we are vulnerable and we are suffering quite a bit from being maladapted to our modern diet. And in this section, losing our old friends, we're basically seeing that some of our maladies, especially things related to allergies and asthma, may be due to the fact that we're not coming into contact with the microbes like we used to. And that contact with microbes was very important to condition our immune systems early in life and get us ready to face these challenges. So many of the traits that we evolved as adaptations to our ancestral environment, once again, they are mismatched to our new environment. We just looked at that with uh, food and the advent and invention of new kinds of high calorie foods in the 20th century making us mismatched to that environment. Uh, but again, like I opened up here, we're dealing here with allergies and asthma. So there's negative consequences to being mismatched to our new environment. For example, we have a tremendous rise in allergies and asthma due to a disconnect, a mismatch between our immune systems and our modern environment. Take a look at the figure in the upper right. So plotting from 1950 to 2000, 
uh, plotting the incidence of infectious diseases. And you can see that infectious disease has plummeted, absolutely plummeted. But at the same time, uh, from the same time period, 1950 to 2000, incidence of immune disorders has skyrocketed. So there's some correlation there. There might be some cause and effect. So countries that um, underwent industrial revolution, uh, England, for example, started, was one of the first or the first to enter that. The United States followed. Uh, and then, of course, other countries have followed after that. Uh, every time industrial revolution has occurred within a country, there's been increases in autoimmune diseases. Uh, if we turn our attention to Venezuela, it, provides a very interesting uh, case. Um, people that live in the cities of Venezuela uh, tend to have very high incidences of autoimmune diseases and certainly much higher than farmers who are living in more rural areas. Uh, and then when we compare them to forest inhabitants, you know, uh, Aboriginal peoples living in the forest, uh, they have really no autoimmune diseases, uh, no allergies, no asthma, etc. <laughs> Pretty interesting. So uh, a big part of why this might be uh, has to do with what's been called the old friends hypothesis. It was called something else earlier in their book mentions that, but I'm just focusing on what it's referred to now. The old friends hypothesis. Children may not be exposed to bacteria and worms that they used to be exposed to. And as a result of that, our immune systems end up being kind of confused and end up attacking ourselves rather than the appropriate pathogens. So take a look at the figure on the bottom of the slide. Environment. We've got uh, developing countries versus westernized countries okay and in developing countries there's large family sizes uh, rural homes you know living in the countryside with livestock and other animals uh, people tend to have intestinal uh, their microflora is variable is transient it changes based on what they're exposed to in the environment they have very low antibiotic use relatively high parasite worm burdens, uh, relatively poor sanitation, high orofecal burden. And we look down at the bottom here, um, they're basically non-allergic. Uh, Whereas in westernized countries, small family size, affluent, living in urban settings, protected from the environment, intestinal microflora stable, um, not shifting due to changing environment, lots of antibiotic use, not many parasitic worms, good sanitation, and what we see are large numbers of allergic disorders, asthma, eczema, rhinitis, etc. So there seems to be a real you know, strong correlation there. In fact, looking at the bottom of our notes on this slide, uh, other some other points formula fed babies they're not exposed to bacteria uh, they tend to develop more allergies playing indoors shelters children from bacteria as opposed to children that are getting outside getting in the dirt getting in the mud getting in the water uh, be, those kinds of children are exposed to bacteria and then we've got antibiotics Children tend to be exposed to quite a few antibiotics and those kill beneficial bacteria as well as harmful bacteria. So by killing those beneficial bacteria, our immune systems are not taught friend from foe, sort of confused. Our immune systems don't know what they should be targeting. They end up turning around and targeting our own cells and our own bodies. So by losing our old friends, by coming out of touch, becoming out of touch with our environment, natural environment, with disease, with bacteria and, you know, uh, um, 
parasitic worms and so on, we're actually leaving ourselves more vulnerable to developing autoimmune diseases. So we've taken a look here at how some of the diseases that we are encountering in our modern age are related to our evolutionary history and they're related to our changing environments. Living to older ages, being more susceptible to certain diseases because of that, including cancer, um, changes in our diets, leaving us vulnerable to obesity, um, diabetes, uh, changes in how we're exposed to pathogens in the environment, perhaps le uh, leaving us more vulnerable to autoimmune diseases. Well, we're going to end here by, you know, addressing this topic, harnessing evolution for medicine. And indeed, that's, you know, our chapter is evolutionary medicine. And we've been uh, dealing with that through all these prior sections. So what you can see from our chapter is that while uh, evolutionary medicine shows us our vulnerabilities and uh, how we are more susceptible to certain diseases and ailments, etc., uh, evolutionary medicine can also be harnessed to discover new causes, identifying uh, things that are causing disease that we may have otherwise overlooked, as well as new treatments, harnessing the power of evolution in order to make our lives healthier, safer, better. So one of the categories we have here is uh, live vaccines. This is related to evolution. Um, so uh, for example, polio is a vaccine, is a live vaccine. Uh, it's a, uh, virtually, polio has virtually been eradicated from humanity. There's still a couple pockets here and there on Earth, but it used to ravage people around the world. Uh, and what happens with live vaccines is a virulent, harmful virus is transferred to cells of some other species, like monkey, and through serial successive passages of the virus from healthy animal to healthy animal, the virus becomes less virulent. It's basically struggling to replicate, struggling to, quote, survive. And the adaptations that occur with viruses during those successive passages make them better adapted to survive and makes them less virulent and less harmful. So eventually we end up after numerous successive passages with a weak virus that can be used as a vaccine. It's still, quote, live. And when it's injected into someone, it doesn't cause the infection, but it does trigger immune responses. So we were able to and are able to develop live vaccines because of our understanding of evolution, harnessing evolution for medicine. We're also able to make better vaccines. So, for example, the search for a universal flu vaccine, instead of giving a new flu vaccine every year uh, because of the ever evolving uh, tips of the hemagglutin and protein on the influenza virus changes very rapidly, very quickly. And that's why we need to develop new vaccines every year. Uh, the base of the hemagglutin and stock. Uh, that protein stock does not change as quickly. Any mutations that affect the base of that stock tend to be eliminated pretty, pretty rapidly. And so there is a search on to be able to develop a vaccine that's based on the proteins in the, in the base of that stock rather than the tips. And if we can succeed at that, then we're going to have a more long-term stable vaccine and we won't have to uh, invest in the time and the energy and the money to keep developing new vaccines year by year. How about new prescriptions for old medicines? So instead of giving chemotherapy for months at a time because immunity develops in the cancer uh, lines and the cancer cells, and it has, and that immunity develops because of natural selection. We saw that a few slides uh, back. 
Uh, instead, drugs can be given in pulses. And uh, in between those pulses of drugs, susceptible cancer cells, ones that um, uh, are uh, not vulnerable to those drugs, they have a higher fitness over uh, those lines of cancer cells that um, are not susceptible to those drugs, that have mutations that allow them to survive. And so the tumors partially grow back from those more susceptible cancer cells. Then, boom, you hit that tumor with another pulse of antibiotics. Those lines of cancer cells that may have become resistant to the chemotherapy have not become established, but they have kind of pulled back, uh, not being uh, having as high of a fitness. And so with those pulses of antibiotics being given, they may prove more effective in completely eliminating uh, cancer. So again, this goes along with harnessing evolution for medicine because we understand how cancer lines of cells evolve, uh, immunity to chemotherapy. So we'll take that to our advantage and develop uh, therapies like these pulses of antibiotics to overcome that. Evolution-proof drugs. So having an emphasis on finding drugs that can stop bacterial infections without creating a selective pressure against the drug. That's what happens with antibiotic resistance. We throw these drugs at these bacteria. Any mutant bacterium that is able to survive those drugs then uh, replicates, passes on its genetics for being resistant, and lo and behold, we end up with lines of strains of bacteria that are completely resistant to antibiotics. So uh, if we can find drugs that can stop infections without creating a selective pressure against the drugs, then we may be able to stop the evolution of antibiotic resistance or at least greatly slow it down. As a case in point, we can return back to Pseudomonas aeruginosa the uh, bacterium that ends up uh, taking advantage of someone with cystic fibrosis and causing these uh, infections in, in one's lungs in different pockets. So those Pseudomonas aeruginosa need iron. They need iron very badly. So what we can do is we can uh, give those bacteria an iron substitute give them something that that acts like iron. We can give them gallium and uh, these bacteria um, are producing proteins called siderophores and these siderophores are secreted by the bacteria and they grab the um, iron and then the bacteria can take in the iron. Well if we instead expose these siderophores to gallium they will take up the gallium the bacteria that will then take up the the gallium instead of the iron and the bacteria will be starved to death and die. But at the same time, there's no selective pressure uh, that involves a resistance to doing this. And so we could persistently have a strategy to kill these Pseudomonas aeruginosa without them evolving antibiotic resistance. And as a last example here, using elephants to fight cancer. Large bodies increase the chances of cancer mutants. The more cells you have in your body, the more opportunities there are for mutations that can give rise to cancer. So we would expect that really large-bodied animals like elephants or whales would have higher incidences of cancer, but in fact, they don't. So, of course, we want to know why. And what is it that we can harness from our knowledge that can help us to battle cancer? Well, we have one copy of the P53 gene that uh, helps to, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a tumor suppressor, help prevent cancer from developing. Elephants have 20 copies of P53, and they have a unique gene called LIF6, LIF6, that is switched on by P53. And when that gene is switched on, it destroys the mitochondria of cancer cells. Uh, 
So by understanding what has evolved in large animals like elephants and whales to help them not get cancer, we might be able to harness some of that molecular biology to help us also um, uh, destroy cancer cells and uh, not allow cancer to take us over in our older age that has left us vulnerable to diseases because of uh, our evolutionary history.